All right, well, friends, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Chapter 12, verse 25. As you do that, many of you probably saw this week on Facebook where I posted, hey, I need your help with this sermon. We also emailed the staff and say, hey, I need your help. Would you send me stories where somebody has spoken a word of encouragement to you? Or would you be so kind as to share your concerns, your cares, your troubles? What's got you down? What gets you down? I wanna thank you for the responses. Let me start with the cares. Let me start with the concerns. Let me start with your worries. There was one common denominator in everyone who responded or sent me something, and that one common denominator was, anyone want to take a guess? Finances. Finances. Everybody who mentioned something mentioned about how their finances have got them down. That caused me to do some digging. That caused me to go do some research. Good news, you are not alone if you are here and you are concerned, you are worried about your finances. As I did some research, I found some studies, two in particular. One that was conducted last October asked Americans what their different stressors are in life. Guess what number one was? Finances. Financial instability, a looming sense that there will be some financial crisis in the days ahead. You are not alone. In another study, the second study, I found this one. This is really interesting. Listen to this. 58% of Americans feel like their finances control them and not the other way around. Rich or poor, anywhere in between, you can feel this. You can feel this. You can experience this. Moreover, even if it's not money, there's other things that drive worries, that drive stressors in our life. There's still plenty to be worried about. I found one study released by Penn State University that reports that 55% of Americans are extremely worried about our country. Another 24% said they are very worried about our country. You can do more research and you can find that one in five Americans take some kind of medicine for um, antidepressant purposes. In fact, the pharmaceutical industry connected with antidepressants is worth 13 and a half billion dollars a year, billion with a B. Worry and stress are part of our lives. They are just facts of life. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Can't our own worries, can't our own stresses block us from seeing the stress, the worries, the cares, and the concerns that other people feel, that other people experience? Can't it keep us from seeing them and lending help? I mean, what if we, what if we, Grace Church, what if we could be a people who can speak warmth into another person's soul? What if we, as a church, can speak hope into another person's life? Think about how amazing that would be. There is so much to love and to like. There is so much we're grateful for about grace. But what if we could take what we do well and do it even better? Think about how we could be helpful to each other and think about how that would help us get the gospels outside the four walls of the church when we can speak sunshine and light into a darkened heart. Well, today, as we turn to God's word, as we turn to his wisdom, we find a call to do exactly that. We see something of the intersection of God's wisdom, our worries, and the ability to speak encouragement and hope into other people's lives. In fact, let me read the text for us. Go with me, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Let me read that again. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. How can we be a people that go out and give a good word? Well, there's three different ways that we're going to see this morning. There's three things this text calls us to do. The first is this, it is to remember. It is to remember the need for a good word. The second thing that we are called to is to know, to know how to give a good word. 
And the third and final thing this text calls us to do is to look, to look to the even better word. Remember, no, look, that's where we're going. Let's look at the first one. Let's see that we need to remember the need for a good word, the need for a good word. I think it becomes obvious when you look at the first line of our text. Let's look at that. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. In fact, go with me to that phrase, weighs him down. Here in this first line, we see a cause and effect relationship between our anxieties and a heavy heart. Let's hone in on the heavy heart. That word weighs him down there. It can mean to take captive to oppress, to suppress. When we look at this word, this Hebrew word, and other parts of the Old Testament, we actually see it used when a conquering king comes into Israel, takes men captive, and forces them to bow down. That's the word that's being used so the conquering king can do what? Walk across his captive's back. Have you ever felt like life is doing that to you? It is weighing you down, throwing you down in the mud, down in the dirt, and life and your circumstances are hard and heavy, and it feels like it is stepping on your chest and it is increasing in pressure. What would we call that today? What would be the modern medical word for that weighed downness? It would be this depression. Depression. This text, in many ways, is getting at depression. Have you ever been in a place where you cannot lift your own spirits? Have you ever been in a place where it's like your your heart has been chained to a boulder and cast into the open seas? Have you ever been in a place where you cannot eat? You don't even want to look at food. Or have you ever been in a place where all you can do to get something down is to gorge on comfort food? Have you ever been in a place where life's circumstances are so weighing in on you, you cannot see anything else, you cannot focus, you cannot get other things done? Have you ever been in a place where there's no real sleep, there's less joy, and even less hope? It's called depression. It's called depression. And what causes depression? What causes depression? This is where the text, this is where God's wisdom is so helpful. This is where we need to see the cause and effect relationship. Look at that word anxiety. Look at anxiety. Our text is clearly pointing out that unresolved, unchecked worries, unresolved, unchecked fears are a major driver in depression. I need to stop right there. Let me give a disclaimer. This text is not saying I did not just say that worries and anxieties are the cause of all depression. This text may not be speaking to the cause of things like seasonal depression, biological depression where our neurotransmitters or our hormones go haywire. It might not be getting at that, but what this text is getting at, the true truth that this text is communicating is this. Unchecked worry, unresolved worry, not taken to the Lord, will lead to depression. It will lead to depression. Let's look at anxiety. Look at that word. What does that word mean? I mean, I think we all get anxiety, but here's something so fascinating about this word anxiety. In the Hebrew, the word anxiety is worry plus fear mushed together into a compound word. Isn't that the heart of anxiety? Our worries and our fears? In fact, here's one definition of this word. Old Testament scholar Bruce Walkie says this. In this text, anxiety denotes the extreme emotional distress caused by the situation of fearing to lose something vital to life. Brothers and sisters, anxiety can shake the human heart. And when it does, the waters of worry become waves that crash against the very chambers of our hearts. And when that happens, when anxiety lodges in our souls, lodges in our hearts, what happens? I mean, physically, don't our hearts start thumping and pounding in our chest? Have you ever found that you're clenching your jaw so tight, clenching your teeth so tight, your jaw muscles start to hurt or you get the stress headache? Have you ever had anxieties where you get this sharp, stabbing, shooting pain in your stomach? 
Oh, friends, anxiety is a killer. It is no fun. When we get anxieties, we're always keyed up. We can't relax. We can't rest, not even on the Lord's day where he gives it to us to know rest. It is a shame. It is a shame. And where? Where do our anxieties come from? If depression comes from anxieties, where do our anxieties come from? There are millions of sources we could talk about. I cannot cover them all, but I think if you think about anxieties in these two categories, this will be really helpful. Two categories. The first category is this. A lot of our anxiety comes from our fear of the past. Our fear of the past. It could be an unconfessed sin we've tried to cover up and now we feel like a fraud or a fake. It could be something like unresolved guilt, unresolved shame that has not been fully exposed to the full light of the cross. We know there's something of Jesus there, but we haven't connected the dots, and so it's unresolved. Here's another one. It can be regret over wasted time, wasted talents, or wasted treasures in our life. When I sit down and visit some of our older folks in their home, in nursing homes, in hospitals, when you talk to somebody on their deathbed, a lot of times, fear of the past, anxiety, shows up in the form of regret. I did not invest my life for Jesus. The time was there, the money was there. I just invested it in other things. And as much as I would want to call you away from that, I think we need to just be aware of that. We need to own that those are possibilities. Friends, fear of the past can be a driver in our anxiety. I think you can probably figure out the second category. What's the second category? If it's fear of the past, there's fear of the future. Very good, very good. Fear of the future. What can fear of the future look like? It could be fear over the future of your job or your life after work in retirement. It could be the future of a child, a grandchild, or another loved one. It could be the fact that school is starting up soon. It could be the future of your health as you grow older. Is my genetic code a ticking time bomb? It could be fear of the future of your love life, whether you are single, divorced, married, remarried. It could be the fear of missing out That's become a very popular one that is even talked about. In fact, a lot of younger kids texting F-O-M-O. What is that? Fear of missing out. The idea that I will somehow live my life and I will have missed something important, something significant. Our culture tells us so much. Don't miss out. Be special. Be unique. Carve your own path. And we fear that we will not do that and we will somehow miss out. That is a form of fear of the future. It could be an awareness that there is so much to accomplish in this life, and I may not measure up. That can be a very real fear. Can I share with you where I have experienced fear of the future? I put myself out there. You shared your stories, let me share one of mine. Three years before my first sermon as an adult, I had a recurring dream, a recurring nightmare. No, we're not about to get all psychoanalytical. I'm not about to start quoting Sigmund Freud or something like that. But I did have a recurring nightmare, a recurring dream. It was about preaching. In this recurring dream, I would find myself in a church either having been asked to be a guest preacher or something would happen and the pastor wasn't there and they needed someone to preach and I'd be like, well, I'm in seminary. I suppose I should be raising my hand. And I would get up in the pulpit and I would just choke. I would just choke. I would stumble over my words. I would not be able to say anything. I would feel the weight of the moment collapsing upon me. And everybody in the room knew that I was a joke, a choke artist, and a failure. Oh, friends, oh, friends. I would wake up. I would would literally wake up sometimes sweating, sometimes with my heart beating so fast it was like throbbing in my ears trying to catch my breath, I knew that I was called to preach. And I wasn't about to let that dream stop me, but I also knew that preaching meant my failures would be very public. That's a form of fear of the future. That's a form of fear of the future. Friends, whether it is the future, whether it is the past, whether it's us feeling like our cares and concerns have been put in a time machine like the Terminator and come back, whether it's the past surfacing up in the present, it can feel like the past, it can feel like the future become a vice 
within which our present is placed and we are being squeezed from both sides. Oh, friends, when this happens, when past regret eats at us, when our fear of the future and future concerns eat at us, it robs us of so much, doesn't it? It robs us of our courage. It robs us of our vigor. It robs us of our vitality. It robs us of our productivity. It robs us of our zeal. It robs us of our ability to rest. It robs us of being able to sense or see that another person needs help too. Perhaps the most tragic thing is this. It robs us of our ability to see or feel or trust or rest in our God's very presence. We are robbed of the joy found in his promise that in the past, we are forgiven, that in the present, he really is present with us, and that in the future, we are, we will be secure. We get robbed of those things, and we get robbed of those things, and we get depressed. What happens? We withdraw. We withdraw, don't we? We withdraw from Sunday worship, the very place we need to be. We withdraw from fellowship and the warmth of other people. And what happens then? What happens then is this. We become like a piece of coal removed from the fire. Rather than enjoying that warm orange glow, we're removed from the fire and our orange glow starts to dim, starts to ash over, and we start to die from the outside in or the inside out, and the next thing you know, we've gone cold. Nobody wants that. What's the antidote? What is the antidote? Does anybody like just feel a need to breathe right now? Right? Like even rehearsing this, I had to sometimes stop and be like, (laughs) right? What is the antidote? It really is a good word. We all know the power of an uplifting word, and we need to remember. We need to remember the need for a good word. Why? Because we really do help others lift their spirits, help them resolve their anxieties, and we help ward off the effects of depression. But here's the thing. We have to know how. We have to know how to give a good word. We need help with that. Let's go to our next point. Let's go to the second line in our text and let's see how we should know and we should know how to deliver a good word. Well, friends, this text really does call us to be a people who can deliver a good word. And think about the benefits. Think about the benefits. When we give a good word, we impart hope. We give relief. We give comfort. We give reassurance. Oh, friends, when we unleash the power of a good word in other people's lives, think about how the quality of our fellowship grows. Think about how we become like that lump of a bag of charcoal just poured out with all coals lit in that warm, hot center. And think about how as we learn to go out and speak good words into other people's depressions or anxieties, we can add charcoal to the lump of charcoal that is Grace Church. Oh, friends, this is so helpful in our lives. It is so helpful in evangelism. Let's go to that second line. Let's read it now. Verse 25, but a good word makes him glad. A good word makes him glad. Friends, we are called to notice when another person's spirits are down, and we are called to impart a good word. But what is a good word? What is a good word? A good word is a reassuring word. It is an insightful comment. It's sharing a time where you've gone through something similar, and it is a powerful tonic to a crippled heart. Friends, at the end of the day, when we talk about a good word, we are talking about encouragement. We need to be a church of encouragers. I think we all intuitively get what it means to give a good word. I think we all intuitively recognize encouragement. We long for encouragement. We kind of know how to give it. And sometimes we give it when we did not even mean to, right? But I want us to have a biblical sense of that word encouragement. The good word that is encouragement. Let's look at that in the New Testament, actually. Let's look at the Greek word for encouragement, parakaleo. It's a fun word, parakaleo. Go ahead and try to say it. Parakaleo. What is the biblical sense of parakaleo? What is the biblical sense of encouragement? Here's a definition straight out of the Greek New Testament dictionary. 
Encouragement, parakaleo, is to instill someone with courage or cheer, to instill them with comfort, to instill them with encouragement or to cheer them up. Can we stop right there? Do you see how our God is calling us to care about other people? Do you see how our God is calling us to be a family of encouragers? Do you see how God is calling us to be a people who lift each other's burdens with words that build up, that bring courage, that bring comfort? It's as if God has made the church its own like mental health support system. Like that's not all that the church is, but that should be one function of the church. Do you see that the God of the Bible cares about your worries? He cares about your concerns. He cares about what is deeply troubling you, and he is doing something about it. He's put measures in place so that you can be lifted up by other people. Do you see God's great care and his love for you in including these words in the text of the Bible? That is amazing. This is what our God is like. This is, this is his heart on display. He is a relational God. He is an affectionate father. Are you here and are you downtrodden? God is with you. He sees you. He is for you. You really are, if you are in Christ, you never really are alone. You're never alone. And what about those times where you try to help other people? Right? The times where we're fearful of helping the clingy, needy person, right? What about the times where we're not sure if we can speak into this situation because we've never seen it? Your God cares. He is still with you. He is still for you. And you can trust that he will move through your words and lift another person's spirits. The God of the Bible is not a distant, impotent, father time lookalike. No, he cares, and he wants his people to care for each other the way he cares for us so deeply. A major way we show that care is by speaking a good word to each other. Let's hit pause. I've got to acknowledge, yes, there are other ways to cope with depression. Yes, there are. You can go to a counselor. You can get tips and techniques. I don't want to minimize that. I don't want to say, no, don't go to them at all. But what we do want to say out of this text is we all need the power of an encouraging word given at the right time. A good word really is powerful medicine for a hurting heart. Mark Twain once said, he could live off of a compliment for two months. I think we all know the power of that. Researchers at Stanford um, University Medical Center have found that a doctor's kind and reassuring words actually help speed up the healing process. I asked you all to send in stories of worries and concerns, but I also asked you to send in your stories of times where you have been encouraged, where someone else has lifted your spirits. There's one in particular that I wanted to share. They were all great, they were all wonderful. You all get a participation trophy, but here is the one that I really wanna share. One man relayed this. He said, not that long ago, we lost my dad in October of 2020. Then our main barn collapsed just a few months later, February 2021. Two months later in April, my mom's house got hit and burned. Every single time, many people came to our aid and helped not only physically, but with prayer and words. One man told me, man, all you've been through and now this new beautiful building you're putting up, stay strong in the faith. The Lord is with us every step. Your boys will look back someday and say, look what dad went through and see how his faith never wavered. What a good word. He says, those words at that moment have stayed with me. I feel sometimes we don't even know when people need a good word or encouragement. Also, I've had a people just randomly say, you're a good dad, or stop at our farm and say, you guys are doing a great job here. Your dad and boys, your grandpa would be so proud. It stops me in my tracks every time. Then he wrote in capital letters there, I love it, encouragement is a good and needed Thing. Amen, hallelujah. And then he clenched it, just straight up, took it to the mat with these words. It doesn't cost a penny to be an encourager. 
Don't we all know that? Don't we all love that? Don't we all want that? And don't we all want to be that kind of person? But here's the question. Here's the question. How? How do we do this? How do we speak a good word? I don't know about you, but I've had times where I've tried and I've just straight swung and missed. I've had times where I've straight kicked the poodle, right? It did not land. Are we called to platitudes? Are we called to cliches? Are we called to flattery? No, we are not. Let's look to our Savior and let's look for the answer to the question, how do we speak a good word? Let's look at the life of Jesus and let's see no less than four ways our Savior, who is a master encourager, could impart a good word. What's the first way Jesus spoke a good word? Jesus spoke with empathy. He spoke with empathy. What is empathy? It's not sympathy, right? We've got to distinguish between the two. Empathy is the ability to see where someone is at and to understand why they are feeling what they are feeling. We see empathy in Jesus' words in the story of the lady who was hemorrhaging for 12 years. Some of y'all have heard this story, but let's just review it. One day, Jesus is walking through a crowd on his way to help a little girl that was about to die, and some lady was in the crowd. She had been bleeding internally for 12 years. She said through faith, I bet if I just reached out and touched him, I would be healed. And what did she do? She reached out, she touched him, and zzz, she was healed. Jesus felt the power leave him, leave him, and he stopped. And what did he, he was like, who did that? His disciples were like, hey, we're in a crowd. Are you really going to figure out who did that? But the lady came forward. Let's put it up. Let's look at Mark chapter 5, verse 33, 34. Look at the lady coming forward to Jesus. She came in fear. She was trembling. She fell down before him and told him the whole truth. It's almost like a four-year-old saying, no, I really did steal from the cookie jar, Right? She's worried. She's anxious. Look at our Savior's empathy in verse 34. He said to her, Daughter, I see where you have been at. I know your pain. I know your struggle. I see your timidity. I see your temerity. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Do you see your Savior's empathy? Oh, friends, friends, our words must be marked with an understanding of another person's situation. When you listen to someone, when you listen actively, when you use your words to ask good, clarifying questions, that very act of listening begins to lift someone else's spirits. When you use your words to repeat back to another person, just repeat back to them what they just said in your own words and watch it lift their spirits. They feel less alone. They feel less cold. They feel less distant from another person. It may not change their situation, but our empathetic words start to build hope. Grace Church, our Savior spoke with empathy, and so should we. That's number one. What's number two? Jesus spoke words of comfort and assurance, words of comfort and assurance. In the Gospels, he is constantly reassuring people, speaking hope and comfort into their situation. If you need a good Sunday afternoon reading, may I suggest John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. You can read it in 15, 30 minutes and just watch what our Savior says. What he is doing in those five chapters is he is telling his disciples, he's preparing his disciples that soon I will leave you. He even sees that they are sad. He acknowledges that they are sad. And in these words, in these verses, what he is saying is this. I am comforting you. I am reassuring you. I am comforting you with the knowledge that I will return I am reassuring you with the knowledge that as I am gone, I am preparing a home for you in heaven. He gives them reassurance. He gives them comfort by saying, in the meantime, I am sending the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, to be with you, to be present with you, to bring my presence spiritually to your heart so that you know I have not abandoned you. Jesus spoke words of comfort, and so must we. There is empathy there is comfort and reassurance. What's number three? Number three is this. Jesus spoke words to impart courage. 
If you would like to do a Bible study or a word study, just go through the Gospels and count all the times Jesus says, do not be afraid or fear not. It feels like on every page of a gospel, you will find that phrase, Jesus building courage. You don't need to fear. You can stand strong. You can be courageous. In our world, on many occasions, we will not be able to help somebody change their trying circumstances. We will not be able to help them avoid their circumstances. They won't be able to go around them. They won't be able to take a different route. They won't be able to go over them. They will have to go through them. And what do they need most in that moment where they have to go through a challenging time? The number one thing they need is courage. Jesus spoke words of courage, and so must we. Jesus spoke with empathy. He spoke comfort and assurance. Jesus spoke to instill courage. What's number four? Number four is this, and this is going to sound a little counterintuitive. Number four is this. Jesus spoke correcting words of truth. Jesus spoke words of truth. Sometimes we need words that reorient us to God's truths. And as we're reoriented to God's truth, it it lifts our spirits. How does it do so? How does it do so? It changes our perspective. When we are depressed, when we are anxious, the lens that is often in place is the lens of self-pity. Being brought back to God's truth removes that lens and puts God's perspective in as a lens through which we can see our trying circumstances or another person's trying circumstances. Perhaps the best example of this comes on the morning of Jesus' resurrection. How many of you have heard of the walk to Emmaus, where Jesus is talking and he comes upon two of his disciples, his two disciples don't recognize him, and they are talking about the events in Jerusalem. Jesus comes up, says, pardon me, don't don't mind the interruption, but what are you talking about? The two disciples, it says in Luke 24, verse 17, they were sad. And as they explain to Jesus the source of their sorrows, what does Jesus say? Let's look at Luke 24, 25 right now. Jesus says something that sounds harsh at first. He calls them foolish. He calls them slow of heart to believe. Thanks, Jesus, right? Just what I needed to hear, right? Did not see that one coming. But what does Jesus go on to do? He says, was it not necessary? And then he shows him how his death was necessary as he opens up the scriptures. At first, this seems harsh. At first, it seems counterintuitive. But look at verse 32. Look at the result. After they recognize Jesus and he departs, what do they say? They say, did our hearts not burn? Were our hearts not warmed within us while we talked on the road? And Jesus opened up the Bible to give us a better lens, a better perspective. Oh, friends, oh, friends, do your anxieties flow from fear of the past? When this happens, whether it's past guilt, whether it's the regret over wasted time, we need a change of perspective. We need truth. We need to know that in Christ, God does not hold the past against us. We cannot compare our wasted years with our years remaining. No, we need the truth. We need the perspective that God will dip his ladles into the dirty waters of our past and pour out clean water on our future. He will redeem it. We need the truth. We need the perspective of knowing, of knowing that eternal life has begun now. And I don't just have 10, 20, or 30 years left to serve Jesus. I have all of eternity I have all of eternity to be productive for him. When you measure your time wasted to eternity, it's very small. We need a perspective change. We need truth. Do your fears of the future paralyze you? Do they loom over you? We need a change of perspective, right? We need God's truth that says the future fits in the palm of his hands. We need a reminder that says he creates, he crafts, he authors the future. We need to remember that the future is just like you. It is a servant of the living God. The future is not our enemy. No, the future is our friend. Our best days really are ahead of us. And even if there are tough times on the horizon, that is not the terminus. That is not the destination. No, in the meantime, our God will work for his glory and for our good. Oh, Grace Church, we need perspective. And perspective comes when you speak words of truth. This proverb is a beautiful proverb. 
It really does hold that a good word counteracts our worries and our concerns. It really does hold that a good word really can help us to smile again. And how do we get there? Words of empathy, words of comfort and assurance, words that bring courage, and words of truth. As we turn to our final point, as we turn to our final point, as we close, let's not forget this. We need to remember, we need to remember that our worries and cares can lead to depressed, heavy hearts. We need to remember, we need to remember that this dynamic is present in other people's lives and they need a good word. But we also need to know, right? We need to know how to bring a good word. Friends, there is help and hope in the Bible, but sometimes we get stuck. Are you like me? Have you ever had a problem getting over the hump of seeing another person and speaking a good word into their life? Where you really question if your kind word will help? There's some inertia to overcome. There's some self-doubt. There's some insecurity. Or there's those times where you've tried and it did not land. Our hearts need help. Our, needs, our hearts need help getting over the hump. What do we do in those situations? It's simple. We look. We look to the even better word. Go with me to John chapter one, verse one. Jesus is called the word. We learn that the word was there in the beginning. We learn that Jesus, the word, was with God. And we learn that Jesus is the word that was God. As you scroll down in John chapter one and go to verse 14, you learn something amazing about our Savior, don't you? You learn that he is the word who became flesh. He is the man that God became when God became a man. Our Savior, the very Word, added on flesh to His body. It's called the Incarnation, and He came to reveal to us what God is like. That is an amazing truth. That is an amazing truth, but why? Why did the Word come? Why did Jesus, why was Jesus the Word made flesh? It's because He came to die. He came to shed his blood for our sins. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. Do you see, do you see that his blood, the blood of the word, also speaks? Do you see that it speaks and it cries out for the forgiveness of our past and the security of our future? Do you see that when you have faith in this word, Jesus Christ, and when you have faith in his shed blood, you can really rest in God's words found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, when he says, I will wipe every tear away from your eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. And the former things have passed away. Do you see that you can have hope? You can have confidence that by God's word, you are headed to a place where the very source of all of our anxieties, all of our worries will be removed and depression and heavy hearts will be no more. That right there is the good word called the gospel. And that right there lightens our load. It makes us glad. Are you here and do you trust? Do you rest in Jesus Christ? Do you rest in the word made flesh? Do you rest in his blood that speaks for your forgiveness and for your security? If not, please come and talk to me. Please come and talk to one of our elders. Please come and talk to Pastor Brad. Let's today be the day that you come to the word and rest in his word. If you are here and you already trust in the word made flesh and his blood that cries out for you, you should be warmed. You should feel that warmth creeping into every crevice, every corner of your soul. And friends, that right there, that right there gives you the confidence that your good word really are God's good words to another person. And that gives you the help, that gives you the hope, that gives you the strength to overcome that hump and go be a person who can speak a good word. Oh, brothers and sisters, this good word is called the gospel. What is our response to it? Today, it's threefold. It is to remember it is to remember the need for a good word. It is to know. It is to know how to give a good word, and it is to look, to look to the even better word, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we love you and we praise you. 
O oh, Father God, you have sent your Son as your word to us to reveal who you are, to reveal what you are like, to reveal the great depths, the great links that you would go to to save us. O oh, Father, you really are an encourager. You really are a good Father. Father, by your Spirit and through your word, please help us to be a people who see the anxieties, who see the heavy hearts found in others, and please help us to be a people who speak good words of encouragement. Father, we love you, we praise you. Help this be so of us, in Jesus' name, amen.